turning there, before I speak, I have something important to say to you. That's a joke. I don't have to. Okay. Hey, I figured it worked, in, it worked on them, it would work on you, but I guess not. So, You know, uh, Don Rinkles said one time, some people say funny things, but I say things funny. You're going to hear some of that tonight, okay? Proverbs uh, chapter number 3, if I can ask you, if you saw a heat wave, would you wave back? Oh. Hey, let me ask you this. We've been hearing a lot of big terms, and, you know, Brother Ross yesterday gave us, I couldn't even spell half of them. Uh, if a word in the dictionary is misspelled, how would you know it? It's a good question. A, a clear, yeah, Bubba Boom, yeah. A clear conscience is usually a sign of a bad memory. I don't know. Break the ice. The kids can come up here and yell and scream. Why can't I? Because the only way to survive is really to have a sense of humor about life. And when you look around you, you should. You know that oceans grow. You know that sponges grow in the ocean, don't you? Just think what the world would look like if they didn't grow in the ocean. Sponges. Okay. Thank you. All right. At least one. I got one. I got... My wife's shaking my head. I don't even look over there, okay? So, anyway. Um, in all seriousness, though, this, this, uh, this evening, um, Ronald Reagan said one time, w w within the covers of the Bible are the answers for all the problems men face. And this evening, my topic is, does God guide? Did the answer is yes? Let's pray. Let's go eat ice cream. You wish it was going to be that simple, didn't you? I should probably start. There, start. All right. Proverbs chapter number three is my intro. Uh, is is the is the verse assigned to to me this uh, this evening? And I mean, we're just going to read, and then we're going to depart henceforth from the text. But it's something I want you to read and have in your mind as we think about how to know and follow the will of God. Because that is a great question today. It is, by the way, a question that just like baptism and speaking in tongues and the message we heard this morning will get you into a fight. And it will get you into um, situations that can cause you some headache if you don't have a proper and clear understanding of what, we, when we talk about, does God guide today? Now, the answer to the question is, yes, He does. Okay? He does guide you today. So then the question then is, is how does he do it? And that's what we're going to really kind of focus on and concentrate on and look at. Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Our dear Holy Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for your word, for the clear instruction when it comes to what you would have us to know, to do, so that in the end we can say that whatever we say or do in word or deed, we're doing it all for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Notice these verses. Who are we to trust in verse 3? Just start. The Lord. That's not you. That's not your desire. That's not your premonition. That's not your wish. Folks, reading and studying God's Word leads us, is going to lead us, should lead you to a scriptural knowledge that leads you to a Bible understanding that leads you to godly wisdom concerning fill in the blank. Whatever you need to put in that blank. Will of God, music, where should I go? Who should I marry? Who, all this stuff that runs through our minds. Because as believers, we need to have God's viewpoint run our life. And we need to have it to be His viewpoint rather than our viewpoint. Who are we to trust in the verse? We're to put trust in the Lord, aren't we? Who are we to acknowledge? We're to acknowledge him, verse 6 says. Where are we to, where, where do we, who's going to direct our paths? He is. 
And again, the question is, how does he? And that's what we're going to answer tonight, I hope. I told Dad at dinner, for to adequately cover the time, I need an hour and a half. I'm just kidding. But I'm not kidding, because it gets that deep with this, and we're just going to skim the surfaces. But what I'm, my goal is, is to give you equipping, some, some tools to take home and to look at and to say, okay, I've got, there are four little Pauline ditties in two verses that will help you in every circumstance in your life. What did Reagan say? The book has what? All the answers. See? And there's two verses that we're going to look at, but we've got we to gotta build there. Because if you want to know how, come over with me to 1 Corinthians 2. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 2. If we're going to understand, and you're going to flip verses with me. We teach, we move, we, we get going, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. If you're going to understand, and first of all, if you want to know what the will of God is, and then how to do it and understand what it is, you need to understand how you know stuff. Well, we got a verse that lets us know that, don't we? 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, look at verse number 9. Helps if I get there. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. How do you, do you, do you see three areas right there in that verse how you know stuff? You have an eye gate. I know there's fancy big words, but I'm not a... I, dude, I live in Arizona. And at 120, you know, things begin to fry. So we keep it real simple. You've got an eye gate, don't you? What do you do with your eyes? You see stuff, you handle stuff, you test it, you look at it, you put a wrench to it, you figure it out, don't you? You have an ear gate. You're hearing conversations, you're hearing discussions, you're, you're hearing things and that stuff gets into your thinking and you begin to mull it over and you say, hey, is this logical? Is this right? Does this match this and does that fit? Hey, does red, white, and blue mean what it really means? When I, and, and you begin to internalize it. Then you have a what? What's the third gate? The heart. And it's with the heart that man believes unto righteousness. And you know what? Of those three, you know what the key one is? Three. <laughs> you know, I could give you the sun devils, go devils. Actually, I would give you a, can I have a roll tide? You know, Alabama. Come on, guys. It's college. We had Michigan up here earlier. In the week in Ohio State, I told Michigan he can't he can't brag about nothing until he wins a championship. You guys okay? <laughs> Hello, <laughs> is this thing on? <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> it really is. But with the heart, what happens with your heart? You begin to believe what you see, don't you? Hey, that's real. That, that's lo you begin to believe what you hear. That's logical. It makes sense. We begin to work things out here. But notice verse 9. If we left at verse number 9, what would happen to you? You could never know the things that God prepared for them that love Him. What's the next word of the next verse? But who? But God. God said, you know what? Man left unto him own self is nothing but vanity and vain, and there's nothing good in him. There's none righteous, no, not one. They all stink. And because I made the decree with Noah, I can't wipe them out again right now. And I, oh, don't you know he'd love to, <laughs> you know? Some of you guys are, I don't know. <laughs> but what is, so he says, no, I won't do that. But God hath what? Hath what? Come on, revealed them to us. Next word, by His Spirit. That's critical. So in order for you to, first of all, to know that you... In order for you to know the will of God, you know what you have to have? You know who you have to have? His Spirit. I've never heard an unsaved person say, oh, I just want to know what the will of God for my life is. Because the natural man doesn't think that way, does he? He's on his own course, doing his own thing. But you and I as believers, we can... So you know what we have to do? We have to have his spirit, don't we? Because what's his spirit going to do? His spirit's going to do what? What's the verse say? He's going to reveal some things to us, isn't he? By the way, if you're here tonight and you don't have his spirit... 
Look at Ephesians 1, verse 13 with me. I agree with Brother Matt this morning. This has become one of my favorite verses when we begin to talk about the gospel. Because it sinks it down real simple. And you know what, folks? I love the simplicity that's in Christ. You can make it difficult. By the way, the will of God is very simple. It's not that hard. Ephesians 1, verse 13. By the way, hold on to 1 Corinthians 2. We're going to go right back there. Verse 13. In whom you also trust, in whom you also trusted, after that ye heard the what? The word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye what? So what do you got to hear? You folks, you got to hear that Christ died for your sins today. And that he was buried and he rose again the third day for you. And if you go out here and you get on this busy road out here and a truck runs you over, absent from the body is to be present no, for the believer. But we'll, we'll, we'll wait a minute. That goes back to our look in the issue of hell the other day. Where do we go? You need to know where you're going to spend eternity. And God Almighty says, my son hung at Calvary. But God committeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. First thing, folks, in order for you to know the will of God is you've got to have the spirit. And the only way to have the spirit and be baptized by one spirit into one body is to trust in the shed blood and the finished work at Calvary. And once you do that, guess who just showed up in verse 13? Then you are sealed by whom? You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, aren't you? Now what can we do? Go back to 1 Corinthians 2. Now we can get in there and we can begin to know some things. Because how does God reveal 1 Corinthians 2? By the way, this is all introduction. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. Somebody moaned over there. Hey, I got 12 pages. And I don't write big. <laughs> oh, man, don't moan. It's okay. You can blame Alex. He taught me well. 1 Corinthians 2. What does God do? By His Spirit, verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Yea, the, cert, the Spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. Had a brother one time tell me, Oh, give me the deep things of God. I said, You're a sinner. <laughs> he goes, No, I want the deep things. You're a sinner. Oh, I want the deep. Come on, Rick. Give me some deep. Christ died for you. Oh, and he's a believer, acting like a sinner. I said, well, you know what? You're complete in Christ. How's that for a deep thing? Oh, but Rick, you talk about that all the time. I know. It's the, <laughs> it's the simple thing. He reveals the deep things. How then does he reveal the deep things? He does it through how? Through where? Through the Spirit working where? In the Word, doesn't he? Look down at verse... Uh, verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the, of, the, of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Let's stop there just real quick about the will of God. He's freely given you a will. You know that? He's freely given you how many things? That means, folks, the will of God for your life is not a secret, and you don't need to be searching and looking for it out there in the whatever the movements talk about today. It's going to be where? It's going to be verse 12. Where, and, and I'm sorry, in verse 13. Which things also we speak not in the, in, the, in the what? In the words. Which man's wisdom teacheth, but, but which the Holy Ghost does what? Where does the Holy Ghost work? In the Word of God, doesn't he? So number one, you've got to have the, to know the will of God, you've got to have the Spirit of God. Number two, you've got to have the Word of God. Now, just real quick, I'll just get, write down Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse number 7. And that ought to be your test verse when you think about all the Bibles out there on the market. Because that verse says, lo, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. And if you pick up a book, a Bible, off the shelf, and it, de it, it degrades the Lord Jesus Christ takes away from his deity, takes away from his cross work, takes away from who he is, the son of the living God, you ought to take it and put it back on the shelf. Because what is, who's the central figure of the book? He is. 
And why in the world would you tote a book that's going to take away from him? You've got to have a book. We have it in English in the King James Bible. So when we begin to talk and we begin to, to, to look and to think about it, we've we got two things so far, don't we? Number one, we have to have the Spirit. Number two, we have to have the book. We've got to have the right book. By the way, I've done a real quick perusal. You can do a deeper one. But I have yet to find a holy scripture that tells you to study it and then tells you how to study it. The Quran doesn't. I've read it three times. It doesn't. The third time I read it, I went specifically looking for, how do I study this book? Now you can look at all the other ones. They don't tell you. You know which book tells you? Only the King James Bible does. Even in English. Check it out. So you got to have a book. And we do. Page two. <laughs> I'm just, hey, you guys got to lighten up, man. It's only Wednesday night. You know? In order to know the will of God, one, you got to have the Spirit. Two, you have to have His Word. You have to have the truth of God revealed. So then, you, and by the way, then once you get that book, you're going to do what with it? Rightly divide it. You're going to get in and study it the way God would have you to study it. Because when you begin to study it, what begins to happen is things begin to come out at you. And the next thing you know, you don't have a question any longer about what the will of God is for your life, how to know it and how to do it. Because it, it's right there. Come over with me to Colossians chapter number one. Colossians chapter number one. Colossians 1, <clears throat> third item here, see if you can figure it out, third course, not faster than the first course, okay? Colossians 1, verse number 9, notice Paul and his petition here. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his, what? Look at that. Sixteen times in Paul's epistles does the will of God, that term, show up. Interesting thing is, as a bunch of it, it shows up in, in the beginning, an apostle of Paul by the will of God. <laughs> okay, well, that doesn't help us, does it? We've got to get it down, don't we? And we're going to have the knowledge of his will in all what? Wisdom and what? Do you see the, the big three there? What do you see? Wisdom understanding, knowledge, don't you? Those are the big, thing, the big three things. And those issues, Paul begins to give us a formula on how to come to some understanding about things. Knowledge. Knowledge is to know something. Knowledge is to get into the book and to study it and to get, get some information out. Know what the will of God is. Know what the plan is and the purpose of God. And what is God doing? By the way, if I could tell you what the will of God is in real one little simple instruction and that is find out what god's doing and go do that well what's he doing he's doing the body of christ isn't he so now what do i gotta do i gotta go get some knowledge about it i gotta go find out and get in and figure this out wisdom the skillful use of knowledge understanding that is to take all that knowledge and wisdom and bring it into your life. Bring it in together. And put it on display. Now watch verse 10. That ye might walk how? Worthy of who? When you have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. By, by the way, little cul-de-sac. I don't have rabbit trails. I have cul-de-sac moves, okay? Little dips. Because a rabbit trail indicates that I only lose it. Because <laughs> I only get one. Have you ever wondered about gold, silver, and precious stones? What, what are they? The book of Proverbs, chapter 16 and verse 16, and chapter 20 and verse 15, indicate that the gold, silver, and precious stone is wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Now, ain't that a kick in the seat? You're over here trying to dig up something that looks good and golden, and he says, it's my wisdom. 
It's my knowledge. It's my understanding. What is the goal of all that? Verse 10, to have a what kind of a walk? A worthy walk, thank you. To have something that's going to now be what? Well-pleasing to the Lord. Walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Folks, to take and have some wisdom and knowledge and some understanding about what the will of God is for your life is important. You need that. But more importantly, you need to begin to understand, how do I get there? Those steps and those keys. Now, you've got Colossians. Just run with me real quick to 1 Timothy chapter 2. On your way, get 1 Thessalonians 5 and 1 Thessalonians 4. So what are we going to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 3. For this is the will of God. Now, would this be some wisdom, understanding, and knowledge? For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from what? fornication who boy wouldn't end that a good thing from the will of god what would he have you to live a pure life a clean life chapter five i love verse 18 you ready for everything give thanks for this is the will of god in christ jesus concerning you did i read it right no what's that first word in Boy, that ought to help you in life. In everything, what are we to be doing? Giving thanks, no matter what's going on. No matter if Alabama Crimson Tide won the Southeastern Conference Championship, went on to win the national championship. Oh, yeah. We had a party at our house. It was just me. (laughs) When I get watching the games, the wife, the dogs, the kids, they leave. See, it, it, in whatever's going on in life, what are we to be doing? Giving thanks. Paul tells Timothy that God's gr- uh, given, freely given us all things to enjoy. And I enjoy it. You should enjoy it. Because what are you doing? You're giving thanks, aren't you? Look at 2 Timothy 2. I told you that one. 2, 2 Timothy 2. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 2. My, my bad. 1 Timothy 2. Verse 3 and 4, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will, what's his will here? Have all men to be saved and do what? Come to the knowledge of the truth. And then he goes on down and clarifies to make sure you have the right gospel and then the right knowledge of the, the right truth in verses 4 and verse 5, 6, 7. He lays it out very clear. No ambiguity. No, oh, is it foggy? Is it really this or is it really that? That's clear, isn't it? What's the will of God? He would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The goal in understanding what the will of God is and how to know it and how he's guiding us is and how to have that worthy walk. Come with me to Ephesians 5. As you're turning there, Ephesians 5, 2 Timothy 2, verse number 7, the apostle Paul says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in how many things? All things. Ephesians chapter number 5, and verse 15, he says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as what? Wise. There's wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, isn't it? Walk wise. Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. So we have wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Wisdom, the skillful use of knowledge. Knowledge where we begin to know the plan and the purpose of God. We understand that. We begin to take that and we begin to skillfully apply it to our lives. And in verse number 8, he gives us an even no, another one in the formula. And it's called, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Well, look at that. Now we got four pieces, don't we? And we've got prudence. Now, prudence is to have the insight. Have you ever talked with someone and you know instantly they have a hidden agenda? 
That's prudence. Go jump in the swimming pool. Put the goggles on. Get the water calm if you can. And you look above the water. What do you see? Everything. Then you look down below and you see the dude coming at you, don't you? Prudence is that being able to see what's going on behind the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Bringing it all into the scenario. How do you, how do you and I get wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and prudence? We have the Spirit. We have the Word of God in the King James Bible rightly divided. We have a formula given to us by Paul and some understanding, don't we? Romans chapter number 1, real quick, Romans 1, uh, well, you know what, you're in Ephesians, aren't you? Look in chapter 4, let's just stay home for a minute, chapter number 4, and look at verse 15, just real quick here, Ephesians 4, verse number 15, the Apostle Paul says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up, see that? What's the design of God for you and I today? That we stay children tossed to and fro, or that do we grow up? We grow up, right? And there's an edification process. Romans 16, verse 25, 26, you know it very clearly. We got my gospel. We start, don't we? And we grow, don't we? And we begin to move. I I need a chalkboard, okay? We we begin to move up, don't we? And we begin to move through the doctrine of, of, of Romans and through the commentaries on Romans of Corinthians and Galatians to fix what we missed in Romans. And then we move to Ephesians and we move into the church and we see what's going on in his plan. And we move into those commentaries of Philippians and Colossians and, and how to fix the mess that we missed in Ephesians. And then we get to Thessalonians and what are the next thing you know, we're in the heavenly places. And then you come to these guys, Tim and Tim, Timothy and Titus and Philemon, and you scratch your head, and they says, oh, look, dude, all that is to reach this pinnacle of godliness. What do you got? You have an edification process, don't you? You got a way to build in the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And prudence. When you talk about the will of God, come over with me to... 1 Corinthians, well, man, i got to do this. 1 Corinthians 16. I want to just show you our pattern for just a minute. Because the next step is who do we, who's our apostle? Paul. He's our pattern, is he not? Now, it's interesting when you read through Paul, when he talks about the will of God for him and what's going on in his life, he doesn't use the preordained roadmap life nonsense terminology. That denominationalism, and I, I love what Brother Russell said earlier, the, the, the uh, professional church operators. He doesn't talk like that, does he? He'll say, hey, I've determined to stay here. I determined to go over here. I determined to winter here. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1, Paul has, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. And he gives the the details for the Corinthians to collect up the collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem, right? Drop down and look at verse number, well, verse 2. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him that there be no gathering when I come. What's Paul's goal? Man, when I get there, we're moving. Let's go. Let's get it all ready. Don't make me wait. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them I will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be what? What's the word? Meet. That I go also, they shall go with me. Look, guys, when I get down there, you have everything ready, and you got the people who are going to be representing you guys ready. And, oh, by the way, if it needs be that I go with you, I'll go with you, but otherwise I'd really like to stay here. But I'm what? Flexible. Now, verse 5, I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia, and it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you. Because before the foundation of the world, God preordained that I would be standing here looking at you. Didn't say that, did it? That I would be, hey, if I get there, I'd like to stay, we'll go. Look at verse 12. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren. 
Now, notice that. What did Paul want Apollos to do? Come with him. But notice the next words. But his what? His what? His will was not at all to come at this time. But God struck him down black, flat as a pancake on the road. Ran him over with the Mack truck. Ed Yarber driving it. Look at that. No, not at all. It doesn't say that, does it? What is it? By that boy, that would be some divine intervention there. <laughs> Ed's a good driver. I, got, I saw the plaque and the ice cream and everything on that one. <laughs> but he will come when he shall have what? When Apollos looked and heard Paul, and Paul said, Look, guys, when I get down there, let's collect this thing up, and if need, I'll go with you. If not, I'd rather stay here and fellowship with the saints. And, I'm, and I really miss Apollos. I wish he could have come, but I got an email from him the other day, and his calendar just isn't clear, and that's okay. He'll get here when he can get here. Do you see any of, anything in there about preordained and you know all this stuff that you hear and read in the books? Not there. Our pattern says, I have a plan to come to you at Rome. When I'm on my way to Spain, I'll stop by and see you. That's Romans 15. Philippians 2, he, the, 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 the name slipped me now. He's sick, nigh unto death. <laughs> anyway, Epaphroditus, thank you. And he says, hey, I supposed it necessary to... Send him home to you. I determined, he tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, I determined not to come down there and see you guys because if I got there, I had to bend you over my knee and spank you like your daddy. Instead, I wrote a letter to you. And the letter worked, by the way. So now when I come, we can have what? We can have a good time and I don't have to be your daddy and spank you because you're out of whack. I determined. I thought it good. You see, folks, Paul took the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, the, per, the, 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 uh, the prudence of the moment. And through prayer and thinking about what God's word says about the situation, then he applied the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to the situation. And he made a decision. And when he made a decision... Some of the brethren around him says, no, Paul, that's not a good thing. Don't go to, you remember Jerusalem and Acts? Man, don't go to Jerusalem. By the way, the Holy Spirit even told him, don't go. And you know what? He went anyway. And you know what God the Holy Spirit said? We'll take care of you. You'll be okay. Now, that's the R.J. version. You go look at Acts where he does. The Holy Spirit doesn't reign. Okay, Zeus, get him. He doesn't say that, does he? He says, Man, he, all right, just we'll, take, we'll help you and we'll take care of you. Man, he wants to stay there. And they said, no, dude, you got to get to Athens, man. And by the way, I'm trying to work dude out of my vocabulary. It ain't happening, all right? <laughs> He's just, no, go. Now look over because... Time's a-clicking. Get 1 Corinthians. You're in there. Get chapter number 6 and chapter number 10. Hopefully you got the idea here that there is, first of all, in order to know the will of God, you have to have His Spirit. You have to have the Word of God. You have to approach the Word of God the way God would have you approach and the issues of right division so that you would then gain the wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and prudence needed to then go live life as who you are in Christ. Okay? You've heard Dad say it. I have all my life. Your Christian life will not operate on the basis of ignorance. The basis of ignorance. 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Corinthians 10. Now, look in 10 and look at verse 31 real quick. The goal is to have a worthy walk unto the Lord in all pleasing, isn't it? Look at verse 31 of 1 Corinthians 10. 
Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the who? To the glory of God. Isn't that our cry? Isn't that our heart's wish? Isn't that what heart, our heart beats? That whatever we eat, say, do, we're doing it for his glory. Now hold 10, because we're going to go back up in a verse, and go to chapter 6. Because there are, I believe, four prescribed areas here that Paul lays out for you and I, one, to then answer the question about the will of God in our life, but then also to help you answer any other questions that come up. Chapter 6, and look at verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Chapter 10, verse 23, real quick. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Does it sound familiar? All things are lawful for me, but all things what? Edify not. There are four things there. Do you see them? Lawful, expedient, power, edify. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Paul gives you... Four points to then help you deal with life, will of God. Should I get baptized? Is it lawful? Is it expedient? Is it does it under the power, the bondage? Does it edify? Some questions that you can ask and judge yourself. Paul tells the Corinthians, "Examine yourself. Look at you, and think about this." Now, the first one, lawful. Notice that he says lawful four times. Four times more than the other three. So do you think lawful is important? I think it is. Because when Paul repeats himself, that means, hey, (laughs) pay attention. You know, lawful, very important. It's the most important issue in all of this. Come over with me to Galatians 5. Let's just run some verses real quick. The clock is ticking. I noticed as the clock got started that it's, 10, it's like 15 minutes sh- slower or faster than mine. Uh, Galatians 5. <laughs> I didn't bring it up here tonight. Usually I got my thing there. The issue of lawful. Just Let's just go to a passage. We all know it. Galatians 5, starting in verse 19. Because when we talk about lawful... We're talking about something that is permissive. Something that, we, that, that is okay for us to be doing. Okay? Notice 519. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, murders, drunkenness, revelings, Riding a Harley, going down the road, no, okay, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, notice that list. Is any of that list lawful for you to do? Permissive, okay for you to do? Well, you guys get it. No, you guys I'm worried about, okay? Look at that list again. Hey, is it okay to go out there and have a little adultery and fornication? Hey, everybody's doing it. It's cool. No, it isn't, is it? No. What happens there? There is a revealed command of God, a commandment, something from God that says you need to remove this from your life. The works of the flesh are what? Manifest. You want to see your flesh. When your flesh is acting up, go look at the list. And the other, bro- there's, a, there's a bunch of lists, okay? <laughs> the list. What does it say? You are to get all of this, what? Out of your life, aren't you? It's to be completely removed from the, 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 the area. I, I, I love the illustration of your life being a stage. If this is drunkenness in your life, you are to remove it from the stage. See that? Lawful is, the Word of God says, don't you do it. Then you don't get a right to do it. Yeah, but. Family feud. Thanks for playing. Doesn't work. 
lawful. The revealed command of God says, don't have that on your life stage, on the stage of your life. But now, he doesn't leave you hanging, does he? Because we just removed something. We put off something, didn't we? Now look at verse 22. But the fruit, please leave that singular when you say it and read it. It is not fruits. It's fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no what? Would this be lawful to have on my life? I put drunkenness off. Now I'm going to put meekness and long-suffering. See? Lawful comes along in your life. The number one issue in your life is what does the Word of God say about it? And if the Word of God says, don't you do it, you can't do it. Let's pray. (laughs) That's it. Because what's the goal? To have a worthy walk, isn't it? To have a life that's pleasing. Folks, your Savior died because of that list. So why in the world would you have that in your life? He died for it. You follow that? He says, put it off. Put it away. Then he says, put on. And you're to put on. You're to put off the things that God says to put off. And you're to put on the things that God says to put on. So, folks, the will of God for your life is love, not lust. It's relevance. I'm sorry, it's reliance, not independence. It's humility, not pride. It's gratitude, not presumption. It's a clear conscience, not guilt. The will of God for your life is integrity, not irresponsibility. It's diligence, not laziness. It's generosity, not selfishness. It's submission, not self-advancement. It's courage, not cowardice. How are you doing with that list? I want to know what the will of God for my life is. Rick, should I go here? Should I go? Hang on, let's back up a minute. How are you doing with the stuff that's lawful? All of my life, everything in my life comes up underneath the purview of what does the Word of God say? That I should be doing. Well, there's no verse that says I should take that job. But there is a verse that says what? Get a job. Get a haircut and a real job. But get a job. Right? So what are we worried about? Well, I got to be the CFO. They pay the most, you know. There's not a verse that says that, is there? just says, get a job, work. That's lawful. That's what you're to do. When everything else then begins to fall into what they call the gray areas, where there's not really a clear verse, now the other three aspects begin to play. Because the lawful is done. The Word says it, that's what we do. Okay? Now, we're all got that old sin nature there, and we, we stumble, and I got it, but what do you do? Fall on my face, First John 1, 9, thank God, I'm a sense, amen. Oh, whew, I'm forgiven. No. Get in the book, figure it out, correct it, don't do it again. See? But when, when, what happens when there's kind of the gray areas? Well, the second issue is expediency. Long-term best advantage That's going to get the job done. Now, the first one was permissive. The revealed commandment of God, right? The second one here in expediency is this best long-term advantage. But this is going to take wisdom. Because sometimes we make decisions and we go, that was pretty stupid. (laughs) You know? And oh, by the way, I don't think I'm going to do that one again. Come over with me to 1 Corinthians 7. Let's just look at a reference here to that. Expediency takes some wisdom. 
that is going to end up being more than just a revealed commandment. It's going to take some understanding and knowledge and wisdom and prudence and putting things together to figure out that this is what I need to do. Now, in 1 Corinthians 7, we have the great chapter on marriage. Right? Come to the end of the chapter, to verse 39. And notice expediency. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to Ken. He's willing to be married to Barbie. Doesn't say that, does it? Who's they to be married to? Whom she what? Will. But only where? In the Lord. Folks, if you're thinking about marriage, don't do it. Uh, but if you're thinking about marriage, I'll get it later. I, I, I have some wonderful marriage jokes, but we're not going to do that. Okay? Look, if you're thinking about getting married, is marriage good? By the way, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, don't get married. It's not the right time. There's things going on right here, right now. You shouldn't even be thinking about getting married because you've got to deal this out and figure this out. Then later in Timothy, he says the widows to do what? Go get married. You need to get married. It's time to get married. So marriage isn't a bad thing. you just got to have some wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. But what does the verse say? Dear Lord, the next blonde that walks through the window, I'm going to get her. Right? No, it doesn't say that at all, does it? Well, Lord, you know what? The next belly, big-bellied, bald-headed dude that walks through, he's the man. It doesn't say that, does it? The next guy that rides in on the Harley. I, by the way, I ride a Harley year-round, so the Harley's references are okay. But see, the thing is, is he doesn't say that. He says what? Only in the Lord. And it's who she will, by the way. Is it in my best interest long-term to get married? You have to answer that for you. One place the word says, don't do it. The other place he says it's okay to do. You got 10 minutes? We're okay for 10 more? Thank you. I'll wait. I'll I'll stand here 10 minutes, wait for the answer. (laughs) You see, now watch verse 40. But she is happier, if so she abideth, after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. It's interesting, by the way, when you read through the chapter, Paul will say, this is the command of the Lord. And oh, by the way, this is my advice now. Okay, see that? Command of the Lord says, if you're married, you've got to stay married. You don't got any outs. Just figure it out. Then he comes over here and says, hey, but my advice is right now is not a good time. Okay, follow that? Expediency, long best term advantage. So you got the top two or the big two. They're the critical ones. Is it lawful? Is it a revealed command by the word of God that says don't do it or do do it? And will it be in my long term best advantage? Is it wise? Is it okay? Hey, folks, you need to have a job. You know why you have to have a job? The word of God says have a job. What job it is doesn't matter. I know they don't have greeters at Walmart anymore, but that's a good job. I drive a school bus, make living in the the school season. And you know what I did? I left that, and I went and tried to play in the office, and the politics got me. But you know what I began to find out? That expediency-wise, see, I told you, I say things funny, okay? When when I got into the office, it was more money. It was this and that. It was all day. It was year-round. But you know what began to happen with me? The study started slowing down because I was over there more. Things began to start doing here and there. And you know what? It dawned on me. I'm sitting there one day after this wonderful gentleman who was my boss decided to tell me some things. And I said, I'm not doing this anymore. And I went back to drive school bus. I can deal with 60 kids behind me quicker than I can one guy who don't know what he's talking about trying to tell me what he knows that he knows, you know. Expedient. Is it my best interest? Does it help? What's the next one? Power. The bondage. By the way, folks, we're up now on high ground here. Because what are we doing? 
We're taking wisdom, knowledge, and understanding what the Word says to us, and we're beginning to bring it into our life, and we're beginning to make some decisions and look at things and go, here, here it is. We're to grow in knowledge, that revealed commandment, and we're to apply that in. Power, real quick, power. The issue of power is who's in control of my life? That's the issue of power. Is it lawful? Is it expedient? Does it bring me under the bondage? Who's in control of my life? Is it the Word of God, studied out, rightly divided, figure out what's going on and do that, or is it me? Who's in control if I do this or if I do that? Proverbs 22, you all know it. The borrower is is slave to the lender. And if I do that, how's it going to hit this? That's bondage, power, control. And then in 1 Corinthians 10.23, you had the other one, didn't you? Go go with me to 1 Corinthians 10.23. We still doing okay? I got 10 minutes, right? 10.23, right? Still got 10? (laughs) I, I know. I already warned her. 23, 10, 23, real quick. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. That edification isn't you. Verse 24, here it is. Let no man seek his own, but every man another, another's what? Well, this issue is the edification of others. This isn't about you. It's about your influence on other people around you. Is it going, if I make this decision, is it going to bring... Some hurt and some negativity to other people, other believers, other folks that I'm in in, in my relations. And if it is, then guess what? I'm not going to do it. Follow that? I'm not going to do this. You go back and you look at 1 Corinthians 10. The context starts back there in chapter 8. And you begin to look down through there. And the, the context is thinking about the other guy. My influence on others should make a difference. I don't have to have a self-serving life. I can sit there and I can say, you know what? It's better for me to do this than that. By the way, what is Romans 12 too? Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to what? Prove what is the good, acceptable, perfect will of who? God. Look at Philippians 1. We're almost done, I promise. Philippians 1. I shouldn't make a promise I can't keep. (laughs) Philippians 1. Philippians 1, verse 9, 10, and 11. Here it is. Folks, when you talk about, hey, can I know the will of God? Yes. How do I know the will of God? I take the Word of God and I get in it and I study and I find out that I got four ways to figure something out. And it's called lawful, expediency, bondage, power, and edification. I'm to have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding going on in my life right here, right now. Oh, but man, Rick, that's so hard. No, it's not. First, Second Corinthians 11, verse number 3 says that the Satan is going to come after you and he's going to come after your thinking. And it, just as he moved Eve off, the, uh, off, of, off of the simplicity that she had in Christ, he's going to come and remove you from the simplicity that you have in Christ. Folks, we're not talking about brain surgery. We're talking about simple things. Philippians 1, verse number 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound, yet more and more in what? Knowledge and in all judgment. That Gia may prove things that are excellent. Look at that. That Gia may approve things that are what? Do you know what that means? That in your life you have removed all of the unlawful activity from your life. All of the sin. You've removed it all. And you've put in its place, verse 11. Look at what, what did you put in that? What did you put in verse 11? That being filled with the what? Fruits of who? Which are by who? There you go. What did you do? 
You removed all the unlawful activity, all the activity that God's Word said you can't do, and what did you put in its place? You put Him, didn't you? You put His activity. You put the fruits of His activity in your life. So when the question comes up, what is the will of God? You know what the answer is? The nearest thing that should be done that God can do through you. So when the question comes, how do I know the will of God? What do I need to be doing? You know, folks, you know it. You get in the Word. You rightly divide it. You, fig- you find out what God's doing and what He's said to you and I as members of the body of Christ. And you begin to learn some wisdom, knowledge, understanding, prudence. And you begin to learn how to live your life. And as you begin to do that, you begin to move into the issue of things that are lawful for you to do and unlawful for you to do. And you begin to move in and, hey, does this, does this have an advantage? Does this control me in the wrong way? And does this influence others? Because the goal is to have a what? A worthy walk. The goal is to have a Christ-filled life. And what's going on in your stage of your life is His life. And to have a life filled with the fruits of righteousness. Folks, what is the will of God for your life? It's verse 11 of Philippians 1. How do I know that? Well, we just spent the last 55 minutes talking about it. The Word of God says, I understand it rightly divided. I've come to that conclusion that this is right. Paul's the uh, the apostle. He says, I'm going to have some understanding, some knowledge, some wisdom. I'm going to get in there. I'm going to ferret it out. And oh, by the way, when at the end of the day, I know for a fact that what I'm doing is the will of God for my life right here, right now. And I have no questions about it. And I have no qualms. Winston Churchill said one time, you have enemies, good. That means you've stood up for something sometime in your life. And I would hope that that's what you would do when it came to the will of God in your life. You've got, st- everyone in this room has stuff in, I'm, I'm the big bad boy, okay? you got stuff in your life you need to clean up, get rid of. Don't do it because Rick said to do it. Do it because the Word of God said to do it. Because he would have you to have a life filled with the fruits of his righteousness. Stand for something. And then when the enemies, then you got enemies. Because what happens? Well, now I ain't hanging out with that group no more. Now they don't like me. I ain't hanging. And I'm over here. (laughs) Brother Ted said something yesterday at the pool. I'm sorry. I just thought about it. (laughs) He says, if I join your conversation, will it disband? That's what happens when you take a stand. We didn't disband. Folks, what's our goal? In everything we're doing, we got tomorrow yet, every, it's to have a what? A life filled with Him. And have it be Him that directs and guides and do, does. Okay? All right, I took 15, I apologize. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the clarity of it. We thank you for the fact that you still do guide in our lives through your word as we study it, as we begin to get the understanding and the wisdom and the knowledge that you would have for us so that at the end of the day we can have a life that manifests your life in these mortal flesh. In your name we pray, amen.